After two long months, NASCAR is finally back this weekend with the Darlington 400 out in Darlington, and it's starting off a span where we have four Cup Series races across 11 days, and there could be even more after that, so it's going to be a pretty wild ride these next couple of weeks. We'll be with you here on the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast to break them all down from a fantasy perspective individually. So today we are discussing just the Darlington 400. We'll have a separate podcast next week to break down Wednesday's race. We've got UFC, so a lot of things popping here on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed. So let's dive in and break down Sunday's race. Welcome on in to the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast, powered by Number Fire. That is right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, here to break down Sunday's race in Darlington. I'm recording this on Thursday morning, which means we don't know definitively where each driver will start. However, we do know tiers. We know roughly where they'll be, which we'll go through in the track breakdowns. We're going to discuss that, which means these are actual recommendations, whereas usually when we record the podcast, I don't know where anyone's starting, and it's all hypothetical. Today, we actually kind of know roughly where drivers will start. So uh, hopefully a more informative podcast even than usual. As mentioned, though, we got a lot of stuff coming up here the next uh, couple of weeks here on the DFS feed. Tomorrow we have a UFC podcast with myself and Austin Swain breaking down Saturday's UFC card to get that. Uh, also our future NASCAR podcast. Make sure you are subscribed to the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed wherever you get your podcast. Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Radio.com, you name it, we are there. So make sure you are subscribed. Also, rate and review the podcast if you like what you hear to help us out in return. Before we dive into the track breakdown for Sunday's race, FanDuel Sportsbook is now available in Colorado. But what's a sports book with no sports? Well, it's FanDuel Anything Book, FanDuel's newest free game. Each day, you will pick one free prop, like the weather, stocks, or anything, pick it right to win $5 in site credit, then play again tomorrow. Play FanDuel Anything Book free only on FanDuel Sportsbook. Must be 21 plus, max bonus is $50. Visit FanDuel.com slash audio for terms. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700. Let's take a look here at the track breakdown for this first race in Darlington and discuss strategies for NASCAR DFS this weekend. This is the first race back after a long layoff, a two-month layoff, which is going to give us a super unique set of circumstances for DFS. We'll start with the basics first, and the basics are that there are a lot of unknowns when it comes to what we're going to see this weekend, and those unknowns impact roster construction, especially if you're multi-entering for tournaments, which is the route I'd recommend uh, for NASCAR DFS. Normally, when you're multi-entering for tournaments, we can have pretty concentrated exposure levels in NASCAR because the fields are so small. So you want to try to keep things tight so you can benefit if your core goes off. And that should still be a goal of what you're doing here if you're multi-entering in tournaments. But you may want to have lower exposure limits due to the lack of data that we have. NASCAR prudently has canceled practice, uh, which, I mean, it should because it means teams don't need to bring backup cars. They're at the track less time. They're out out in the open less time. That's good. But it does rob us of one avenue of data. And there are essentially three pillars of data in NASCAR DFS, uh, practice, current form, and track history. One of those pillars is gone. We have practice data for every single race last year. So it's a pretty unique circumstance here. The first laps they will run in two months will be under green flag conditions in Darlington. They will have an extended caution early on to allow for wholesale changes, but things could get bad even before that. Drivers will likely be pretty conservative, but things could get wonky, and there is extra randomness involved because of that. And when there's extra randomness and less certainty, we want to safeguard ourselves a bit in DFS because we're going to whiff. We need to make sure we are accounting for the fact that we're going to make mistakes and we're going to pick drivers who crash or just don't do well broadly. So if you're multi-entry for tournaments, it is wise to spread things out more so than you usually would. You still don't want to get too spread out, uh, but there is less certainty here, and that should impact our lineups. Also, with no practice, you will want to learn more on what we, you want to lean more on what we saw in the first four races this year with a couple of caveats. 
the reason to lean on current form here is that current form is always going to be our best data when it comes to uh, prognosticating for NASCAR DFS. Last year in Darlington, the current form section of my model actually did test better than the practice data. So current form is always good. But it's also the only four races we have seen with drivers in their current cars. So it's even more impactful than it would be normally. The Cup Series goes to Darlington just once every year. So if you want a three-race sample on track history, you're going back to 2017. Almost half of the field in that 2017 race will not be racing this weekend. Only 10 of the drivers in that race are still on the teams now that they were on at that time. So track history is important. It does matter, but it's a tougher sell given the the the, the changeover we've seen in NASCAR the past couple of years. And with no practice either, current form is going to be our best outlet. There are a couple of notes within current form, though, that I think uh, we should keep mind of when looking back at that data from those first four races. The first thing is that there have been two months since the last race, and although they have not been on the track, teams have still had time to adjust their cars and their setups since Phoenix. They've had Zoom calls, they've had some time in the the shops uh, the past week or so to get things ready. Teams that were bad early on may not be bad on Sunday, so that's worth keeping in mind. Not a lot of time to change, but there has been at least some time. We've also seen only one race at a track That's even mildly similar to Darlington from a a shape perspective. That was in Las Vegas, another intermediate track. The tire fall off there, though, not as great as it is in Darlington. So even that one is not really a one-to-one relationship. So it's still going to be our best avenue for data. Current form is imperfect, but it will be our best outlet. But it's just another reason we'll want to be a bit more conservative from an exposure level than usual because we don't really know how this thing is going to shake out. That's the data side of things. Qualifying procedures are also pertinent here. They're going to set the field for Sunday effectively based on owner points. Uh, The full order should be set sometime by Friday, it seems. And the top 12 cars and owner points will be the top 12 starters for the race. We just don't know the order of those 12. The order of those 12 will be set by a random draw. They'll do the same thing for drivers starting ranked 13th or 24th in owner owner standing. So... We at least have an idea of who will start where now. We just don't know the specific spots yet within that lineup. And starting order will be important. And that's something we should always account for, whether it be DFS or or betting. But we don't need to target drivers for DFS in any one specific starting range. There are 293 laps in Sunday's race. That is 29.3 Fandle points available for laps led, and this means we should emphasize finding drivers who can lead laps. We do want to try to get those drivers in our lineups. They just don't necessarily have to start up front to do that. If you look back at last year's Darlington race, which is the only one we've had in this current aero package, there were three drivers who led at least 75 laps. One of them was Kurt Busch. He started fourth. Uh, That's kind of what you expect, a guy closer to the front being more likely to lead laps, but... The two others, Eric Jones and Kyle Busch, started 15th and 33rd, respectively. So as long as your car is fast enough, you can make up ground at this track. And it also helps that because there is some element of a random draw here, the drivers who start up front aren't necessarily going to be the fastest in the field. That means we have freedom with our studs and our mid-range plays to kind of go where we want from a starting perspective. If you really like a driver... You can use that driver if he is starting first, obviously, because there are a lot of laps to be led. But you can also still use that driver and count on them to potentially lead laps, even if they wind up starting 12th instead. Place differential drivers will also be in play, too, and we'll touch on a couple of them in the driver breakdown. So basically, just go with the drivers you like the most, you think will be fastest on Sunday. For Sunday, you don't need to sweat starting order all that much. Again, it does matter, and we want to find place differential drivers, guys who can lead laps, but Darlington is a place where you can pass, and the starting order may not be predictive of the finishing order as much as usual, so a couple of advantages are there in giving us freedom to not, you know, force ourselves to roster drivers in any one specific zone. The only difference, I would say, is with value plays, because there I would prefer them to start further back, because we get points for place differential on FanDuel, uh, so using drivers starting further back gives you more cushion from a finishing perspective. Let's say there is a driver who starts 20th and finishes 12th. 
that driver will score more FanDuel points than a driver who starts ninth and finishes ninth. And that's assuming that they don't lead any laps, finish on the same lap and stuff like that. So for value plays, I do want them to start a bit further back because it gives me more wiggle room in case they don't get a top 10 finish. There are two exceptions to this uh, trying to find value plays starting further back who I'm okay with. We'll touch on them in the driver breakdown. But for the most part, I want most of my value plays to be in position to pick up some place differential points for me. So recapping strategy here for Darlington, I would lean on current form and what we saw those first four races. And at the end of 2019, at similar size tracks, I would spread out my exposure a bit more. You still want to have a tight core, you know, keep things at least semi-tight, but maybe loosen up a little bit just to account for the randomness we should expect to see on Sunday. I would emphasize laps led uh, because that's certainly important. There are a lot of laps to, to be led, but... Don't force yourself to roster drivers who are starting at the front in order to get those laps led. As we saw last year, you can lead laps from further back, and that gives us some freedom when it comes to where we find those laps led. Finally, look for value plays further back if they are there. Got a few options close to the front as exceptions, but for the most part, we want our value plays to have a little bit more cushion from a finishing perspective, and there are some who can give us that for this weekend. That breaks down the track breakdown. Let's move here to the tier-by-tier driver breakdown, starting with the elites on FanDuel. That is Kevin Harvick at $14,500 through Brad Keselowski at $12,000. And all five drivers in this tier will start within the top 12 spots. So it's kind of pick your poison. Which driver do you like most? And to me, in this upper tier, it comes down to Kevin Harvick and Joey Logano. Both those drivers have a blend of track history and current form. Harvick does rank first in my model, and he is tied with Kyle Busch for the shortest betting odds of the race. Those are both good things. He has had a top 10 average running position in seven straight Darlington races, and he has six top five finishes in that time. He also led a good number of laps in the first four races this year. Harvick had some troubles at times leading laps last year. Wasn't an issue through the first four races, and I think that's encouraging. He also had a third-place average running position in Las Vegas. But Logano won that race. It is one of two wins for him so far this year, and the other was in Phoenix. And he doesn't have a bad track record at Darlington either. He was second in 2018. He has three top fives the past five races in Darlington, so the current form is there. And he's been good enough at Darlington for us not to view him as a negative there. To me, I would say that Harvick and Logano are neck and neck for my favorite driver in this race. But Harvick costs you $2,300 more than Logano. So once we account for salary, Joey Logano is my favorite driver in the upper tier on FanDuel for this week. He's plus 750 to win. I actually like him at that number as well. So uh, Joey Logano, to me, the number one guy in this race. I do think that Brad Keselowski, Logano's teammate at Penske, is a light version of those two. He's $12,000, so both the Penske drivers and Harvick, intriguing to me. In this upper tier, we also have Kyle Busch and Denny Hamlin. They're a tough pair to read because Joe Gibbs Racing really struggled the first four races, even though Hamlin won at Daytona. But they've had two months to tweak since then. I think that if any team benefited from a long layoff, it may have been JGR. It also does help this race is in Darlington, and if if Joe Gibbs Racing is going to bounce back anywhere, it's going to be here. Joe Gibbs Racing, or affiliated cars, have won five of the past seven races in Darlington. I'm going to have those two guys ranked below Logano and Harvick because I saw them do well early, and they've done well enough here. So I'm going to pick those guys first, but it's really hard not to uh, buy into Joe Gibbs Racing. So if I'm ranking out this tier, Logano 1, Harvick 2, I'd probably go Bush 3, Hamlin 4, Keselowski 5 as far as the way I'm viewing them for this weekend. Let's move to the second tier on FanDuel. That is Chase Elliott at $11,700 through Jimmy Johnson at $10,000. And I mentioned that I'm willing to buy in to Kyle Busch and Denny Hamlin on the rebound. But I think that if you want to buy low on Joe Gibbs Racing, Martin Truex Jr. is pretty easily the best way to do so. Now, The thing that's different with Truex from Bush and Hamlin is that he will start outside the top 12 because he is outside the top 12 in owner points. So Truex will start somewhere between 13th and 24th. So that's bad for him from a betting perspective, but it's good for DFS because you're going to get some place differential juice with Truex. 
that safeguards you in case the JGR cars continue to struggle here in Darlington. But he was also, I think, the best uh, Joe Gibbs racing car early on. He just didn't get the finishes to show for it. His average running positions, the first three non-Daytona races, were 8th, 9th, and 11th. He just had really bad luck that forced him to finish poorly, which is why he's outside the top 12 in owner points. Truex is a good driver in Darlington. He won here in 2016. He led a bunch of laps in 2017. So if we're looking at this thing straight up and not accounting for starting position or salary, Truex actually ranks fourth in my model behind Harvick, Bush, and Logano. I think he is a high floor due to the place differential upside and a high ceiling way to buy into Joe Gibbs racing off their early struggles. So yeah, I don't mind Bush and Hamlin, but I think if I'm trying to buy low on JGR, Martin Truex Jr. is the best route at 11.5 on FanDuel. The rest of this tier is basically the Hendrick Cars and Ryan Blaney. I know the Hendrick drivers, I'd rank Chase Elliott at the top. He had really good speed early on. He is won three stages already so far this year. Nobody else has won more than one. And Elliott finished fifth at Darlington in 2018. I'd put Bowman ahead of Johnson just because Bowman was so fast in Vegas and Fontana. Fontana was another high uh, tire wear track and Bowman just ripped up the field there. So I think that Bowman is up there with Chase Elliott ahead of Jimmy Johnson. Ryan Blaney, kind of similar to the JGR cars where he's tough to decipher, but it's just flipped from where we were, what we were talking about before uh, with Truex, Bush, and Hamlin. The current form for Blaney is elite. He had a top four average running position in both Vegas and Fontana, the two most similar tracks to Darlington we've had so far this year. So Blaney could have conceivably won all three of the first three races. Based on that, he is a threat to win here, and I think his betting odds may be a little bit too long at 22 to 1. The problem is that he's pretty bad in Darlington. He has never finished better than 13th. His best average running position is 14th. He did lead 50 laps and finished third here in the Xfinity Series last year, but that's really it uh, if you're looking for good track history. Again, though we're dealing with small samples when it comes to track history, and Blaney was so good early on. So I think that when I'm looking at tiers within this one tier itself, I'm going to put Blaney in the same blob as Chase Elliott and Alex Bowman. They have great form, uh, and and the track history does not bump them up. So I think that I'm going to put those three in the same tier. I'm going to rank them within that tier, Elliott 1, Bowman 2, Blaney 3, and then Jimmy Johnson 4, but Truex is ahead of all those guys and my clear favorite within this second tier. Moving to the mid-range on FanDuel, that is Eric Jones at $9,800 through Eric Almirola at 8000 This is where we can find some really good potential place differential guys, and I think it's a good tier overall. So I'm trying to potentially be a bit more balanced in order to get more drivers who are within this tier. There are four guys on this list, Jones, Kurt Busch, William Byron, and Clint Boyer, who will all start in the 13-24 to 24 range. Eric Almirola is the one guy at the front, and I do think he is an option. But he's not my favorite among cheaper plays starting near the front. So we'll talk more about that in a second. But for now, let's rank that middle range. Eric Jones won at Darlington last year. That's obviously awesome. He has a top nine average running position in all three races uh, he has done at Darlington. But he was among the JGR drivers who struggled early on. So there is some risk there with Eric Jones given the slow start to the season. Kurt Busch also has elite track history, similar to Eric Jones, and he was running better before that layoff. Uh, Kurt Busch had a top six finish in Fontana and Phoenix. He had a top nine average running position in three straight Darlington races, and he's actually ranked sixth in my model. I think that's a little high. I would not put him that high personally, but it does show how well Kurt Busch grades out based on the track history and being at least decent in those opening four races. Jones is is seventh in my model, uh, but the form worries me there too. So both Kurt Busch and Eric Jones grading out well in my model. Some reason to be a bit more skeptical of them, but I do like them at their salaries for DFS. William Byron is 9,000. He is the only Hendrick driver starting outside the top 12, uh, but he had an eighth place average running position in Las Vegas. He also had a 10th place average running position in Darlington last year. That's really good. And we know the speed is there. Boyer also ran well in Darlington last year. He just wasn't as good early in the season as these other guys. So to me, I think anybody in this tier is fully viable. But if I'm ranking them, I'm going to put Kurt Busch at the top. He's a veteran at a veteran track, 
where there's a lot of tire wear, a lot of slick stuff going on. So Kurt Busch, number one for me. I'm going to put Byron second and Jones third. Then there's a drop-off to Boyer in fourth and Almirola fifth. So to me, it's Bush, Byron, Jones at the top end of this middle tier on Fandle. But overall, I really do like this tier and want to be in here pretty regularly and potentially shape my roster construction around trying to get guys in this range. The value tier on FanDuel is Matt Benedetto at $7,800 through Tyler Reddick at $6,600. And DiBenedetto is starting near the front of the pack, which means I would not go there in cash games because there, there's a lot of risk. But I am interested for tournaments. DiBenedetto finished 8th in Darlington last year despite being in really bad equipment. He had a 14th place average running position. He's had speed so far this year, including a second place finish in Las Vegas. So this car is good, as DiBenedetto showed there. Paul Menard, who was in this car last year, finished 9th in Darlington, one spot behind DiBenedetto. So among the cheaper drivers starting up front, DiBenedetto is my favorite. I mentioned that I like him more for betting than for DFS because uh, his odds are pretty long and he will start up front. But I think that he is in play for DFS too. Just make sure you are accounting for the fact that it is a risky move to use DiBenedetto. I just happen to think he's worth that taking that risk every now and then. Among those starting in the middle of the pack, I do dig both of the Roush Fenway Racing drivers. Those are Chris Busher and Ryan Newman. Busher is kind of like DiBenedetto uh, in that he ran well at Darlington even before he was in decent equipment, which he is in right now. Busher had a top 14 average running position and a top 13 finish each of the last two years in Darlington. Now, Busher hasn't really had a ton of speed so far this year, but he has managed to finish well, and that's valuable. Newman is in his first race back after that scary, scary wreck in Daytona, which is honestly incredible that he is back already, uh, but he is back, and that's good. Uh, there could be some rust, though, because he hasn't raced since Daytona. He had a, a very scary injury there, so there is risk there, but Newman is good in Darlington. He had an 11th place average running position in both 2017 and 2018. I'd rank Busher higher because he's not coming off as long of a layoff, but I'd consider both these guys. Uh, so I think both the Roush Fenway drivers are at least intriguing in this middle range. I also want to quickly mention Tyler Reddick at $6,600 because he will start outside the top 24, but he's been really fast to open the season. He had a 14th place average running position in both Fontana and Phoenix. He was also running really well in Las Vegas before he wrecked late in that one. Reddick finished third and second here in the past two Xfinity Series races, now moving into Cup, and I think that Reddick, especially if he draws really poorly, would be an awesome awesome value play at $6,600. Uh, talented guy coming up from the Xfinity Series, decent equipment, will start in the back. That's kind of all you want. So Tyler Reddick, I think one of the better value plays on this slate, and he's not the only RCR ca- ga- driver that we like. Speaking of which, let's move to the punting tier, which is Ricky Stenhouse Jr. at $6,400 on down. And in this tier is Tyler Reddick's teammate, Austin Dillon. I think that Dylan is lined up like Reddick to be one of the best value plays on this slate. The reason is that Dylan is only $6,200, and he's starting here between 13th and 24th, but he's been good in Darlington. He finished 4th in 2017. He was 10th last year, and he had a 10th place average running position in 2017 as well, so not a fluky finish there. He was also really good in Las Vegas. 13th place average running position there. He finished 4th. So that's all really good, and that's why I'm intrigued by Austin Dillon. I would be a little bit turned off if Dillon were to draw right at the front of this range and start about 13th, but I'm still going to have quite a bit of him at $6,200, just because the finishing upside is is so good for someone who is this cheap. So Tyler Reddick and Austin Dillon, two elite level value plays, especially if we can get them at the bottom end of their starting tiers. There are a couple of drivers in this uh, punting tier ranked outside the top 24 who I would consider. One of them is Christopher Bell at $6,000. He's had a really bad start to the year, but he's driving the car that Di Benedetto took to an eighth place finish last year. And we know that Bell has talent. Uh, just haven't seen it quite translate yet. So between the rookie drivers, I would rank Tyler Reddick ahead of Christopher Bell, even though Bell is $600 cheaper. I like Ty Dillon, Austin's brother, at $5,000. Uh, Ty... Finished 13th here back in 2017. He had a 20th place average running position in Las Vegas. That's not that bad. So Ty Dillon at 5,000 intriguing. I also mentioned Ryan Priest because Priest was not as good in Las Vegas as Dillon was, but 
Chris Busher, who was driving this car last year, uh, Priest switched teams to the same team. Uh, Busher finished well for this team last year. Priest finished 22nd, but that was his first time at the track at any level since 2016. So you would expect some groin pains, and he now be, may be more familiar with the track. Between those guys of uh, Austin Dillon, Christopher Bell, Ty Dillon, and Ryan Priest, we should have enough value to pepper that middle tier middle tier starting in the middle of the pack. That that 9,000, 8,000 range that I really liked, I think these guys give you the ability to get into that tier more often. So I'm very willing to go with these drivers, especially if a guy like Pre starts super far back or if Reddick starts super far back. We're going to have flexibility, and I want to use that flexibility to get into that middle tier as often as possible. That does wrap up the tier-by-tier breakdown for today. So let's finish here with the win picks for the first time in two months. It feels nice to pick some winners here once again on the podcast. If you are a new listener, the way this works is I pick one driver to win who has a salary of at least $10,000 on FanDuel and one driver who is below that. And we're going to go with a couple of veterans for this weekend. The first one is Martin Truex Jr. Because I believe in the bounce back for Joe Gibbs Racing, and I think that it kind of goes back to what we discussed before. You can still do well in Darlington, even if you start a bit further back. So I'd expect Truex to be a great place differential guy, but I also think that a win is within his range of outcomes. So let me pick Truex as my winner at the top end. Below $10,000, we're going to go just a bit below with Kurt Busch, $9,400. Really good track, rest, track record in Darlington. He was pretty solid over the opening four races, especially the final two races, and we know he can do well on tracks that have heavy tire wear. So Martin Truex Jr. and Kurt Busch, the two win picks for this weekend. As mentioned, we are back once again tomorrow talking some UFC with Austin Swain to get you set for Saturday's card. So make sure you are subscribed to the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed to get that and our upcoming NASCAR podcast Tuesday morning is when we'll be recording the podcast uh, for the Darlington 500K, which is coming up on Wednesday. There's an Xfinity Series race on Tuesday, too. I uh, don't believe any DFS on FanDuel for that, but uh, potentially some betting, which you can check out there for sure. If you have any questions for me, I am on Twitter, at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for running the video side of things here today and chopping up some clips for the FanDuel Twitter account. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. I hope you are healthy. Hope you've had, uh, you know, as good of a quarantine as you can have, and hopefully things have gone well for you and your family. We get to watch some live sports again, and it's been uh, it's been it's been a really rough uh, couple of months, but it's nice to get at least some semblance of normalcy once again this weekend, which we will get at Darlington via the NASCAR Cup Series. So, uh, good thoughts going out to all of you. Good luck with your DFS lineups and your bets this weekend. We'll talk to you all again on Tuesday. This has been the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast, powered by Number Fire.